Coming up, West Fargo has built a seemingly indestructible softball dynasty. Find out what the Packers see as their secret to success. Plus, Alex Heiner joins us to tell us which top marks in the Dakotas won't be touched this year. Which state reigns supreme in track and field? We are attempting to find out as we pit North Dakota against South Dakota in the first Varsity Sports Interstate Medley. All that and more just ahead on Varsity Sports. Hello and welcome to Varsity Sports alongside Jason Andera. I am Jay Elson. Well, the West Fargo Packers have literally never finished below first place at the North Dakota State Softball Yeah, tournament. that unprecedented success mixes both pride and a little bit of pressure for the West Fargo program. I set out to find out just what it takes to be such a dominant team. Each year, West Fargo High School has had a softball team they've brought home a state title. To put that in perspective, the seniors on this season's West Fargo team were born the same year the Packers began their unmatched string of championships. So that got me thinking, what does set West Fargo apart from the pack? Well, I came up with four keys to their sustained success. Number one, their coach, Pat Johnson. He's the one constant in each and every championship. Not every team can take batting practice off of one of the most accomplished fast pitch pitchers in the nation. His resume as a player includes 12 state titles, four regional championships, and two national titles. He sets the tone for this program. Well, I, I'm kind of intense, so that's, I, I'm, and the one thing with that is, is it shows that I'm into this game. I need you to be into this game. Um, as far as the ones that, you know, if they do something wrong, we got to correct it because we don't want it to keep going. We don't want to make a bad habit a habit. He's the one that keeps us bare down. We could be winning a game 10-0, to 0, but he still wants us to play like we're losing 5-0. This program is definitely something Pat has built over his, you know, 30-year pitching career, and we're really lucky to have him as a coach. Number two, a team-first philosophy. Teamwork and the amount of time and dedication it takes to become a champion is drilled into each and every player. Everybody's got to be ready to play and they all got to have put the time in. They all got to realize they're, you know, they're teammates and that's more important than the, you know, individual. There is no, you know, we're not about individual accomplishments. We're about team accomplishments. I think that we display that really well with our team. We show that teamwork and dedication are essential to having success. Number three, developing players. One of the keys to the West Fargo dominance is obviously their talented player pool. But they don't appear out of thin air. Many start as middle school players who adopt the winning attitude of a high school team. Basically from there on, you're kind of taught what it is to be a player at West Fargo, what you, what practices consist of, and what you need to do to make it to that level to play. So varsity goes to the junior high and we try to pray, play with them and practice with them and just kind of be around them and stuff. And me as a junior high student, when I was that age, I guess that's when it kind of really sunk in that these people are becoming my role models. But not every player has years of softball experience under their belt. They also have to develop players who start late. We have two players on our JV who have never played softball before, never throw a ball and uh, one of them got into the JV game. Um, and there's some that aren't. There's some that, I have a basketball player and she plays a lot more basketball than she does here, but she's starting in center field at times for me. Number four, don't rest on tradition. Each year, you know, we set our goals and each year, so I'm more year to year. You hope, the goal is always the same, is to do the best you can and, and worry about ourselves. If, if we can build and, and play the best we can for ourselves, then we usually do pretty well. We come in to the year with the, the same mentality that it's a new year, it's a new program, different team. Um, so it's not, we don't consider this our 18th championship, even though it's what's told to us. It's the first championship for us and for our teammates. We always want to be better than the year before. There's no, last year you guys were so good, it's this year we're going to be better. This formula for success is not easily duplicated, and it's hard to tell just how long it can keep producing championship teams. Are we going to keep winning the state title? I couldn't tell you that. There's teams out there that have, you know, bullet, you know, they're, they're looking at that bullseye. 
Will we win 20 in a row or even 18 in a row? I don't know. Uh, but we're going to try and we're going to keep putting the effort forward. Um, if we lose, we lose. But we're going to go out with an effort and we're going to go out playing good softball, hopefully. Now this type of success seems to be so hard to comprehend that we had to do a little research to find out just how remarkable of a feat winning 17 consecutive titles really is, Jason. And as it turns out, West Fargo softball isn't even alone at 17. The boys tennis program at Grand Forks Red River, they've also won 17 consecutive yeah, state titles. Thanks times. for putting this list together, by the way, Jay. A lot of time and effort to figure out who has the longest current or not current streak but streaks of state titles but as you see a lot of these are current how, how about south dakota how does this state compare madison certainly leads the way with a national record of 16 consecutive titles between 1995 and 2000 yeah, not as many current streaks but that 16 in a row by jim uh, madison really sticks out the one that is current right now, O'Gorman Girls Tennis, eight straight yeah. titles. Uh, the Knights have also won five straight on two separate occasions, so quite a program uh, that they have in terms of girls tennis. And of course, you, if you want to see more, there is plenty yeah. more. We dug really deep on this one, so go to the blog at midcoSN.com. We'll get all that information there for you, and you can take a look uh, for yourself. But for now, when we come back, Alex Heiner is going to join us to take us through the highlights from the Metro Conference meet in Sioux Falls last Friday. Varsity Sports on Midco Sports Network is presented by AE Tech Electrical Training Center in Rapid City. Varsity Sports on Midco Sports Network is presented by Shields. And hey, welcome back inside Varsity Sports here again for an update on the state of high school track and field is Alex Heinert and Alex for obvious reasons there wasn't much going on in the western part of the Dakotas this past weekend. That, of course, after the winter storm canceled more than a handful of meets across the area. Not often do you have to call off a meet because of snow in May. Yeah, I know, right? The foot and a half of snow in western South Dakota forced Saturday's prestigious Black Hills Classic to be canceled. But the winter weather stayed away from East River long enough to get a few meets in on Friday and Saturday, including the second annual Metro Conference meet on Friday afternoon at Sioux Falls O'Gorman. No snow to be found at a sun-drenched McEnany field, much to the delight of the four Sioux Falls AA schools and Brandon Valley in attendance. It was a good day for the Stars, starting with Lincoln's Jasmine Cooper. Due to blustery conditions, the freshman wouldn't quite hit the heights of her best times this season, but she'd still cruise to two titles on the afternoon with wins in the 800 meters at 221 and in the mile in 513. Cooper would be one of several bright spots for the Pats, but for the girls, the Metro Conference meet was all about Brandon Valley dominance. The Lynx would show off their sprinting power early and often, led by Krista Bickley and her three individual titles on the day. Bickley would win the 100 in 12.54, take the 200 in 25.98, and lead a BB sweep of the 400 in 57.53, along with Tanya Tingle and sister Courtney Bickley, all of whom would finish under the minute mark. The Lynx relay teams would have strong showings as well, including wins in the medley and the 4x4. Add that to a pair of wins in the field, and the end result was a solid 48-point victory for Brandon Valley's second consecutive Metro Conference team title. We are up against some really good competition here. The Lincoln girls and Washington girls, Roosevelt, I mean, they are a really good competition for us to run against every week. So, And that's one of the things that we see them a lot, so we know exactly what we have to do. And uh, like you said, that's one of our first major uh, goals checked off this year. As expected, the boys' team race was much closer, with Lincoln and Roosevelt both vying for the title. The riders had the edge in the sprints, with Taryn Christian and Chase Vinatieri going 1-2 in as tight a race as it gets in the 100, only two hundredths separating the two. Vinatieri would have to wait for his title, but he would get it in the 200, edging Washington's Isaiah Fetchel 22.57 to 22.82. The riders would get two more individual wins from May Winna Cook in both hurdle events, and a victory from Josh Gearing in the 800 meters in a great time of 156.61, that's the second best mark in AA this year. Gehring would just beat Lincoln's Ned Sudbeck in the half, but the Patriots senior would get a win in the quarter with a 49-5-8 effort to finish five tenths ahead of Fetrell. Will Lauer would also play his part for the Pats, though he would be pushed all the way in the mile by the riders Jesus Ertu Swastigi. Lauer would get the win barely at the line, 423-22 to Jesus' 423-92. 
but the future Stanford Cardinal, he'd take the two mile also with much less fuss, a winning time nearly 28 seconds faster than second place. In the end, the efforts from Lauer, Sudbeck, and the sheer depth of the Pats would be just enough to put them on top of the team podium by a mere three and a half points over Roosevelt, 116 to 112.5. Something that we we talked about this this week and and uh, just kind of stepping up and placing and not really run, worried about our times but just worried about where we placed and and uh, we had kids step up today and and uh, do a great job so I was proud of them. Now the state track meet's obviously a much different animal than a five team conference meet so you don't want to read too much into Lincoln and Brandon Valley's victories here but it's also hard to ignore success against direct competition. I feel like the wins at the Metro are going to bode well for both of those teams chances in the hills at state at the end of May. All right well good to keep in mind. Stick around up next on Varsity Sports we're going to broaden the conversation on high school track as Alex and I make a return trip into the acceleration zone. Stay tuned. Varsity Sports on Midco Sports Network is presented by AE Tech Electrical Training Center in Rapid City. Varsity Sports on Midco Sports Network is presented by Shields. Back now with Alex Heider for more track and field here on Varsity Sports. And it's time to go into the acceleration zone for more debate on the topics that matter right now. And Alex, what time are we going to highlight this week? Well, we're stretching the definition of time a little bit here, but we're honoring Dave Zittleman, longtime track coach at Bismarck High. He will take over this summer as the new activities director of Bismarck Public Schools mm -hmm. after the retirement of Jim Hausler. As you know, after all your, your dynasty uh, research this week, Jay, yes. Zittleman helped lead the Demons to 11 state track titles and 10 state cross-country titles, 21 in total. So with that in mind, we're going with 210 for our mark this uh, week. I see what you did there. An impressive run. Uh, certainly yeah, worthy of the distinction here. Well played. All right. Uh, the gun is up. And here we go. First up, the final thoughts from you on the Metro Conference meet. Well, for the boys, it's scary how even Lincoln and Roosevelt are. Taryn Christian looks healthy now after a hamstring pull a few weeks back. Nate Schroeder, though, for the Pats, had to sit out the meet with a lingering knee problem. Schroeder was huge for this team last year at State. From the 800 up, they're going to need him for a shot at a repeat in AA. For the girls, hey, shout out to all the unsung Brandon Valley kids. Hannah Hendrick won the pole vault is always great in their 4x4. Emma Trevere won the long jump the other day. Haley Waterfall, Lauren Wells, Danica Koser, Courtney Klatt, they're all solid in the 800 and up. It's more than just the Bickley's and Tanya Tingle that have this team poised for something great. All right, along with the Metro then, the other big events last weekend that avoided cancellation were in uh, Fargo and Grand Forks. What stood out up north? You know, at the Orvik Radke East-West Boys Classic, which is a great name up in Fargo, we had a lot of the same storylines we're used to. Carter Gorney held off Hunter Johnson by eight one-hundredths in the 100. Sam Clausen served Bismarck won the mile. John Tharleton won the shot in the disc. Pretty ho-hum stuff. The plot just continues on. And the same could be said for the Grand Forks Girls Classic, although we had a couple of meet records go down. A really good meet for Fargo Shanley's Afur Ada, who's a threat now in the one, the two, and both hurdle races in Class A. And for West Fargo's Keely Walker, who nearly exceeded her own platinum mark with a 44-4 effort in the shot put. Wow, impressive. Speaking of platinum, what marks fell this week? You know, not too many. With, with so many meets canceled this weekend, we just had four changes total between the girls and the boys' leaderboard. That's the fewest all year. So let's look at the platinum marks that I believe aren't going to change from here on out. For the boys, I don't see many of these track marks changing before the state meet, if at all, really. I don't, I don't see anybody touching 10-4 in the 100, nor do I see another sub 155, 800. There's no way somebody's going below 901 in the two mile. We could send the medals now, and I'd feel pretty confident. In the field, I think it's the opposite. I think any of these could go down. Tharaldson could throw 63. Nelson, somebody else could go longer than 178. Caleb Ellis seems to add a, an inch to his pole vault mark each week. None of those are safe. On the girls' leaderboard, Macy Hines is 211. Maddie Shirley Fairburn's mile and two-mile marks, those are safe, as is Courtney Dowling's quarter time. The 200 could still fall, but a lot of those marks aren't changing. In the field, just like the boys, I could see any of these going down. Whew, and that's our time. But it's, it's going to be interesting to see what sticks and what doesn't. Track marks seem to be pretty set. Field marks pretty up in the air. Well, it has been a great run. Literally, it's been a great run, Alex. Uh, thank you for that. Don't go too far now. Uh, we've got a little more track and field coming up on the way, including something we're calling the Varsity Sports Interstate Medley. That's interesting. It's coming up next. Stay tuned. Varsity Sports on Midco Sports Network is presented by AE Tech Electrical Training Center in Rapid City. Varsity Sports on Midco Sports Network is presented by Shields. 
And welcome back. Well, the rivalry in track and field between North and South Dakota has been enhanced a bit this year with the introduction of the Varsity Sports Platinum Competition. But this week, we're going to take things a step further. That's right. In our quest to determine who's better when it comes to high school track and field this year, we've organized boys and girls medley relays between the best runners from the two states. Oh boy, well for the rundown on who the athletes competing are, here is Alex Heinert with the Interstate Medley. Alex? Well thanks guys. Let me just say I'm very excited for this. At the upcoming state track meets we're rolling out the first ever Varsity Sports Interstate Medley. We're picking two 200 runners, a 400 runner and a half miler from each state. We'll take their best individual times from their respective state meets to determine our team champion. Obviously they won't be running head to head but it's track and field in the spirit of former Hickory High head basketball coach Norman Dale. I'm pretty sure 400 meters is the same in Bismarck as it is in Rapid City. As I'm from South Dakota, I'll be selecting our team to represent the Rushmore State and to pick the runners from up north. Let's welcome in my cousin from White Earth, North Dakota, Alan Heinert. Hey, thanks, Alex. Excited to be here. All right. Well, hey, as we'll be picking our girls' teams next week, let's start with the boys today. Who are you going with with North Dakota? for your 200 legs. Well, I've got it pretty easy, really, on this choice. As we know, North Dakota's two breast sprinters in the state are pretty clear cut in Minot's Carter Gorney and Bismarck's Hunter Johnson. They took second and third in the special 200 at Howard Wood last weekend. They've both been in the high 21s or low 22s all year, and they're gonna put the Peace Garden State out in front after that first lap. Are you, are you sure about that? Now, you glossed over that Gorney and Johnson finished behind Spearfish's Damian Hall in the special 200. So he's getting the baton for South Dakota first, and he's getting us out in front. The second spot, though, that was a tough choice, but I've got Hall handing off to Mason Herricks of Watertown, a junior that's run the 110.4 seconds and the 222.2 this spring. Okay, good picks. Who's next for South Dakota at the 400 spots? That's, that's another tough call here. There's a lot to like about Freeman's Brennan Schmidt, who's gone 48-1 this year, but I'm going to roll with Ned Sudbeck of Sioux Falls Lincoln. Okay, you're taking Sudbeck over your guy that's tied atop the platinum leaderboard? Ned's run 48-3 this year. That's the second best mark in the state. And even though he might have a heavy program to contend with, potentially running the Open 4, the Open 8, the 4x4, and the medley, Schmidt is poised for a much busier weekend. He's got the best time in Class B in the 1, the 2, the 4, and the 8. And if he runs all those, he could have eight races in two days when you add in all the prelims compared to five or six at most for Sudbeck. And plus, Sudbeck's going to have to run a 48 to win the AA quarter title. He'll be pushed by Paul Paul, Isaiah Fetchel, Anthony Bachmeyer, all those guys all the way. On the other hand, Schmidt's best time is three seconds faster than anybody in Class B. And given the amount of races he's in, he could literally coast to a win and still go running away. If it was a standalone race, I'd pick Schmidt, but that's not the nature of the interstate medley, Alan. All right, fair enough. Now, you've spent a lot of time deliberating that choice, didn't you? Probably too much, yes. And I would agree, because it didn't matter who you picked, they're not beating Century's Jacob Richter. The Patriots senior proved it on two occasions at the Dakota Relays, beating Sudbeck and the rest in the open quarter, and then running a 47-second split anchor on, Patriots, on the Patriots' 4x4 win. Personally, I'm feeling pretty good about North Dakota's chances at this okay. point. That's understandable. Here's the thing, though. Everybody knows the medley is really about the 800 leg, and South Dakota has by far the best half miler in the area. In Sturgis' is Jacob Simmons. He went 154.9 a couple of weeks ago in here, almost a second and a half better than anybody else in either state. Even if South Dakota is trailing after the first three legs, the future USD Coyotes going to bring home the title on the anchor carry. Okay, I'm not going to argue with how great Simmons is, but don't forget, North Dakota has a couple of outstanding 800 runners too. As much as I want to pick Ryan Wheeling of Newtown, who's from my home county in northwestern North Dakota, I can't get over that he'll be running the half three hours after what's going to be a grueling two-mile battle with Shiloh Christian's Elliott Stone. I'm not sure if he'll hit the 157 mark that he did earlier this year after something like that. So I'm going to go with Burn Curl of Bismarck St. Mary's in that spot. He's posted the best mark in North Dakota this year, a 156.8, and he's a great quarter miler too. So I think he's got the speed to go even lower against some great Class A competition. Hey, no arguments here. Great picks today. Hey, you too made the best state win. <laughs> Sounds good. We'll be back next week to select the girls' medley competitors. Until then, he's Alan. I'm Alex. Back to you guys. I tell you what, it is always fun to see the side-by-side -side comparison. That's what certainly interests people. The side-by-side -side uh, comparison of the cousins or the states? Uh, both, yeah, yes. I agree. Um, that was also interesting. I, you know, I had no, no idea about Alan coming in, so that was a pleasant surprise. Yeah. Um, 
But as we now look at some of these numbers, look at the times. yeah, I mean, South Dakota by a hair. This is going to be a very close race. It's going to come down to a second or so, which is why I think Allen might have the edge because Alex didn't pick Brennan Schmidt on his team. I, I might come back and get him. Uh, I've learned one thing uh, over the past the month, the, the last month or so, and that's not to doubt Alex Heinert when it comes to track and field. I think Alex Heinert uh, has got it. I think South Dakota uh, will get the win in this in the end. But as we've learned from the Platinum Leaderboard throughout the last several weeks is these times are constantly better getting better. better. Uh, everybody's getting quicker out there. So we, I think, are going to have to. It's going to come down to the wire literally on this one to determine who is the fastest. All right, well, on the other side of the break, we are going to take a peek at a big football event that took place in Sioux Falls last weekend. That's next. Varsity Sports on Midco Sports Network is presented by AE Tech Electrical Training Center in Rapid City. Varsity Sports on Midco Sports Network is presented by Shields. And hey, welcome back to Varsity Sports, Jason. It is never too early to talk football, right? You gotta love football. Absolutely. We had a big football event uh, come to Sioux Falls last week at the Riggs Power High School Football Combine. All right, Jason, now let's take a look at some of the top marks that we saw at this event. Yeah, you got kids from, like we said, Minnesota, Iowa, South Dakota, and in the 40-yard sprint, Dodie McQuinja, the running back out of Sioux Falls, O'Gorman, blew the field away and these are true times folks lots of good numbers under a 473 mark are, are the top numbers here you look at the bench press this is 225 that they're putting up Juan Marquez out of Sioux City East put it up 19 times I wow. watched him do it it looked like he could have went maybe even a little farther so great defensive lineman out of Sioux City and then in the vertical jump that was fun to see how many quarterbacks placed in the top board here sure. just on this uh, top list here you see players like Luke Fritch number two on the list wow. the quarterback at Sioux Falls O'Gorman all right well that's going to do it for us for Jay Standera and Alex Heinert I'm Jay Elson we'll see you back here next week